This podcast is dedicated to the Dakota. We are grateful for the people who care for the land on which our community building resides. Thank you. Season's greetings. Welcome back to the Students' Co-op Memory Journal. This is episode 8. This time, let's have a casual, meandering stroll through the halls of the co-op with very good friends and co-opers of the late aughts. There is some mystery about that era because that is literally right before the cohort that I was in early 2011. That's when you started, Maxine? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Laurel was still visiting the Mm -hmm. co-op. Yeah, I was around until I moved out of Minneapolis in January 2012. So I was around until then. Um, And I know that, yeah, the cohort just after us was like, yeah, it was definitely a renaissance. So hopefully we can help out. And then there was even stuff that happened before we were there like the broken window and the frat and back getting shut down and stuff like that. So that was like just before I I was there. Mm. Okay. So let's begin with introductions. If you don't mind, maybe Laurel introduce yourself since you were there earlier and then Ryan introduce yourself. No reverse. Reverse. (laughs) I was there earlier. (laughs) Oh, okay. Just introduction. Okay. Well, I'm Ryan push. Oh crap. We can't use last names. Um, <laughs> well, are you talking negatively about yourself, self-deprecating? <laughs> you will be. Uh, yeah. Uh, I lived there 2006 to 2007 when I was gone for a year. And then I moved back in 2008 to 2009. Yeah. My name's Laurel. I lived there like summer 2008 until fall, winter um, 2009. So I overlapped with Ryan. <laughs> When we moved out, we moved into a house together after that. With another co-oper. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that spinoff project? It was just a regular old house. Yeah. We did have a chore wheel. Well, man, I was so bad at chores when I lived with you guys. It definitely came back and bit me. because. Did you learn nothing from the students' co-op? I think Laurel and I probably did learn very different things, actually. Laurel, you you were president, right? Or were you vice president? I was vice president. When we lived together. And was Micah's president? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he was my roommate. We had all the executive power concentrated in one room. You could have stolen the co-op again. Oh, yeah, we could have. And I remember, I definitely wasn't like a complete, you know, dirt bag when I was there. But I, I think I remember even once realizing that I missed weekend dishes or something. And I was just like, oh no, I'm scum. Did you have a fine? Yeah, there was a fine for sure. If you didn't do weekend dishes, I'm probably totally misremembering, but I thought it was like $40. Or there was yeah, a fine. $50. There was a fine and it was, uh, it went up on a f- number of offenses. <sighs> and I know this because I was house manager and- You had to dish them out. I had to, I had to dish them out. And I remember there were a couple of times where I went easy on somebody. I let somebody off. And uh, <laughs> there was one person, I let them off because they were just, you know, they, they gave me this little sob story and they're like, it'll never happen again. Da, 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 da. And then they did it again. Uh, and I was like, oh, I got suckered. I, that was quite a moment. I, I definitely got burnt out on that kind of house manager stuff. I remember you talking to me about how it was the vice president had to do all the work. Yeah. The president, the president just led the meetings. But I remember I, you had to collect rent, right? Yeah, no, I didn't have to collect rent. I had a lot of duties. The way I saw it was um, there were, the president's job was to be like somebody that everyone held in high regard. Um, so no one would ever be mad at the president. <laughs> and then, yeah, they also ran meetings and they were the tiebreaker and they had to talk to the, the frats or whatever. And then the house manager was like, yeah, all the dirty work. Like I ordered first aid supplies, told people to do their jobs and stuff. <laughs> Definitely a heavier, heavier lift. So this was when house manager and vice president are synonymous. Mm-hmm. But we did have crowns. So that was nice. We had plastic crowns. That's, I remember those crowns. I was looking at pictures before this and I found 
a bunch of pictures of like a house meeting that we had, like an all house meeting that we had. And I'm wearing a yeah. crown and Micah is wearing a crown. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. We had some crowns. Yeah. So one cool thing about uh, the time that, that Ryan and I overlapped was we had about a, like a six month period where nobody moved in or out. It just felt really great to be there and just like we could do anything in the world. Okay. We did very little like new projects when I lived there. Mm -hmm. We redid this brick pathway on the side. And I remembered we were working. Oh, on there's Mike. Mikey. Yeah. We were working on this brick pathway and there was this uh, frat guy on the house <laughs> next to us and he was talking to us and eventually it got kind of weird, but he said, I think it's so cool. You guys have girls that live with you. <laughs> <laughs> and then later on he invited us to a party they were having a party that night and uh i think it was julia was like oh what day is it is it saturday he was like yeah she's like sorry we have our house orgy tonight we can't make it <laughs> <laughs> were there actual orgies going on yes no. or no no yes or no don't prevaricate <laughs> uh. i don't believe so I feel like there are sort of different eras where there were different norms and, and things. And I heard that there was a time where there was that kind of stuff going on and wasn't as fun as you'd think it would be. <laughs> I'll just say that. But I don't have any truth to that. That's just a rumor I heard. There was enough drama there for that I could, I don't know, in other times, yeah, probably was <laughs> different, different social norms. Was the cow the refrigerated milk dispenser in the basement? No. Okay, that. that was gone. I figured that was we gone had, in the 2000s. We did have a towel service, which I still think of longingly to this day. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> oh, right. Wasn't that FPA, Fraternities Partner? Fraternity yeah, partners? Uh, good memory. Yeah, I just, when I moved out, I would use towels to clean cast iron pans. And my roommates moving forward would be like, you can't do that. I'm like, but the towel... Oh, but the towels, like they don't get cleaned by some <laughs> random person anymore. <laughs> right? The person who comes in with a big bag of clean towels and takes all the dirty ones away. There was a giant, yeah, there was that giant bin in the kitchen, right? Mm -hmm. That's just where they all ended up. That was someone's job. Summon the towels and put them here <laughs> and then distribute the towels again. So you were there when the sidewalk along the side entry was done but you no, you were there when it was redone. So I think it was actually put there earlier. Yeah, it was like it had gotten all gnarly and like lumpy and hard to walk on. We were both there when the facade fell off. Oh, tell us about that. That I've been trying to nail that down. So I think it fell off twice, if I'm not mistaken. So it would have been like early on in my time there. I was like physically in the house when it happened. Was Captain Tony just on the porch and then moved from the porch and then it fell that i don't know i can differentiate a little bit with the captain tony timeline captain tony was there the day i moved in he welcomed me he helped me move my stuff into the house actually whoa and and then that winter he lived on the front porch the first winter i lived there with his friend who whose name i can't remember and i think he had his dog 50 at that time too I always said that we lived on his front porch, so. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just think of that and being there as, well, this is just the way it is. But obviously that's a very easy way to kind of wash over his, I'm sure, very difficult existence and our mostly indifference to it. Mm -hmm. It was definitely a fraught thing because I remember yeah. at times he would apply to live at the house. I think it happened before I lived there. I didn't know. He actually filled out an application. Yeah. Wow. See, I remember sometimes he would like talk about it and then nothing would happen. But that he would sort of ebb and flow with being in people's good graces. Right. I think the longer people had lived there, the more comfortable they were with him. And and also he wasn't there the whole time I lived there. I'll just say he, around. He'd be around. You didn't That's know if he was always there. Mm -hmm. I remember he had a business card that I still have somewhere. Really? He had a job sweeping the bar down the street, which I think oh, is. Oh, that sounds familiar. But we would go there. We'd go to that bar on Sundays and watch a weird TV show. What bar was that, if you don't mind? Maybe it was the Dinky Towner. The Dinky Towner. 
But was that the closest one there just down there was to one, down like the right on university yeah okay i, I think it, now it's like raising canes or something oh yeah it is are you looking at a map raising canes <laughs> it was something like the uptowner or the something like that <sighs> that must be a difficult location with so little parking and so much foot traffic of busy people rather than mm. people who like have extra time to sit and it was really divey he had like a phone even the, the card has a phone number on it wow so i remember the first year i lived there he spent the winter on the porch in the freezing cold with a giant sleeping bag with his friend and every day he'd be he would get like a duraflame log of that what is it like paraffin wax soaked sawdust and he would cut a puck out of it and then he would burn it in the, the, like a coffee can on the porch and and roll his own cheap as you can get tobacco cigarettes and sit there and smoke those and drink really cheap. like he wasn't ever drunk i don't think that i that i witnessed him but he was like alcohol was definitely around as well and that's somehow how he survived a minnesota winter outside it's like harrowing thinking about that i remember him carrying a backpack full of cheap booze that he would get out or the yeah. beer yeah that is something i wish i could like go back and yeah change my approach and i think be a little more humane toward him because I remember we had a lot of fears toward the end of my time there about the housing inspector. It was sort of this like mythical figure. One never came, but we always were afraid of it. It might have been prophetic because eventually what happened was the housing inspector did come. They found where he had been staying, where I won't mention. Mm -hmm. And they did say that he had to leave. But Captain Tony somehow predicted this would happen and vacated the place before the inspector showed up. And so we cleaned up the space and he ended up being connected with a place for homeless people. And he was given care for his tongue cancer. Is that what killed him? He survived some form of treatment and he was happy about that. But then it could be just a year or two later that he did leave us. Yeah. I remember hearing that he died and, and I just knew like he wasn't that old, right? Maybe in his forties and just thinking that's just, that's the cost right there. So he had a story about when the, the 35 W bridge collapsed that yeah. 50 was dragging a rope of a raft out to rescue people and bring wow. them from the Mississippi to shore. I never knew what to think about that story, but he was full of very Yeah, that sounds stories. pretty mythological, but 50 was pretty amazing. 50 was a great dog. Yeah. Apparently all the police knew him and called him Captain Tony and said hi yeah. to him. Rewinding just a little bit back to the collapse of the facade. Yeah. I would call it like a plinth. Is that a word? <laughs> oh, that's a great word. Um, and that's the part that fell. And it definitely, it was during the middle of the day. And so it was definitely kind of a situation where I'm sure people had coffee on the porch that morning. And then it, it fell a short time later. But I was in the kitchen. It made a terrible noise. And is that when it was chopped up and thrown under the front porch? It sure was. <laughs> <laughs> what a great solution <laughs> i grew up in the country and that's how you deal with problems you just chuck it in an outbuilding that's you know that's how that works but now i'm like what were we thinking <laughs> that would make sense because you would eventually find some project to use that material for or just get covered by trees and logs and whatever and you'd never think about it again and that's that do you know if compost bins were present when you first moved in, Ryan? I believe so. But that must have been started in the 2000s. We had a worm bin. Yes. That's the first time I saw vermiculture. Maybe there wasn't a compost bin. I could be projecting that back to a, a previous time. But yeah, there was vermiculture. I remember that there were white bins, like maybe three or four gallon bins with a screw top. 
mm-hmm. and we would throw the compost in there to reduce the smell. And when the compost was thrown out, it was put into compost bins on that side walkway. Yes, I do remember those there. So either they were there when I lived there or when I was still visiting after I moved out. Okay, thank you. All I remember is these like, maybe they were black worm bins and they had a nozzle at the end that the worm juice would drain into. For the tea. Because I remember people kicking that jar over sometimes by accident because it was right at foot level in a high traffic area. Worm juice for tea? You dilute it for like fertilizing gardens. Oh, thank goodness. Yeah. (laughs) Because that wouldn't surprise me either if co-opers were experimenting with nutrition. Drinking worm juice. Remember when uh, some co-opers made a delicious tea in the French press? (laughs) So, yeah, I do want to talk about this because, Laurel, I want to get details from you that I don't remember. But it was it was utterly disastrous. It was we we poisoned ourselves, really. And unfortunately, like it, it had a lasting effect on me. For a week, I don't think I could really focus my vision very well. You got balanced to ride a bike. Yeah, I was like, I couldn't read the next morning. I was trying to read. And I mean, I don't remember exactly what happened the night we did it because I like went in and out of consciousness. But I remember it being very, very disturbing. And and then like never really getting that clear of idea like what it all happened from it either, because I think it disturbed more than just the people who drank this stuff, mm-hmm. which I was one of them, unfortunately. Like one thing I like about the co-op is that things that seem weird are just sort of normal there. <laughs> mm. People do things and you're just like, well, that's just how that person is. Um, I think tolerance is like an underrated virtue these days. <laughs> but then when the four people took that, that tea I was mad because they didn't tell anybody beforehand. They didn't, I mean, true or false, you didn't really uh, like research what it was going to do or the risks or anything like that. I was, I was trusting Ben and, and he didn't know what he was doing really. And, and I don't hold that against him because none of us knew that was my naivete. And we were all like gathered on somebody's computer, like researching and just sort of being like, well, now we have to take care of these four people who've done this thing, what's going to happen to them. And one person just went right to bed and just were like, whatever, nothing really happened. Ryan, I remember you sort of just being really out of it and sitting in a chair yeah, and not really being coherent, but you were like not wandering. The big concern with that is apparently people like wander away. People fall off of cliffs or whatever. It's a disassociative. So you, it was extremely difficult to move and to speak or to do anything. Mm-hmm. And I remember, bless her heart, Anya looking me dead in the eyes. And when I was going through this and saying, Ryan, if there's anything that we can do, or I can do that is going to help you get through this, please, what, what can we do? And I remember it took all my energy and everything I had in me to just say, I don't know. <laughs> like, like It was, that's how miserable oh, no. it was, you know, like, yeah, it was very uncomfortable. And yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm conflating the other two people who did it. And I can't remember which one is which one of them was just sort of out of it and then went to bed, but then had like insane dreams where they dreamt their roommate had like no skin talking in their sleep and saying all sorts of weird stuff. I heard voices when I was in in between dream and waking state too. So not just them. And then the last person like just sort of hung out and like couldn't function. I remember he was trying to open the door from the living room to go back into the annex to go to the bathroom and couldn't use the door handle. So we like helped him open the door and then someone helped him go to the bathroom. That was me. I, I, that happened to me. I remember my fine motor skills were all shot. Somebody else, we were just like sitting watching TV and there was a person, a resident and then their guest who I think it might've been like a date or something. And then like the super high person that's sitting next to him. And the super high person put his hand in the date's pocket. And the guy was like, huh? And we're like, oh, oh sorry, no. he's putting balls right now. Like, sorry, like, should have warned you. It was awesome. That was, cool. <laughs> that was, when it was like, fun, but yeah. Yeah, the person who was growing that, they also like, I came into the kitchen one time and they were cooking a big old pot of San Pedro cacti. So that person was into some weird stuff. Yes. I think that the other issue is I wasn't very close to that co-oper and 
yeah. So there wasn't like the trust that needed to happen to, to do such things. Mm. So apparently the house had an association with North Country Co-op, but it closed yeah. its doors after 37 years, I think in 2007. And the house shifted food sourcing. Yes. Do you remember like Co-op Partners Warehouse becoming like a primary food source? I think it was James who was the... Yeah. Old Ladies Buying Club. Was that what it was called? Some people called it that. Uh, sorry, ladies, you're awesome. If you're listening. We should spend a lot of you know time talking about just the culture of the kitchen, which I think was extremely beneficial and influential on my life. The hospitality, the food, the, the supper club experience there was truly magnificent. First time I lived there, it was actually pretty poor quality. But the second time I lived there, it was unbelievably positive. Laurel, were you there when we got the deep fryer? Well, I was there. I was there when we got all the old bulk bins from the Steward Co-op when it switched locations. Mm -hmm. James got those. Bulk I don't know if they're bins. still oh, there. like the dispensers with the big yes. Yeah. All those are from the Steward Co-op because James worked there, I think. And then we put all sorts of funny, funny pictures on them. Like I still remember the freaking TVP bin had this picture of this woman in a bikini and it said Perio hits. I don't know what that is. And I've never looked it up, but that's what I called TVP for a really long time. <laughs> it sounds like someone on a drug trip trying to remember the name Paris Hilton. <laughs> it was like, it looked like an album cover or something. I don't know. Uh, Text with vegetable protein. Yeah, that brings you back. <laughs> there was also, I think, Laurel, you reminded me that like my goddaughter's picture of her baptism was like set above the above oh. the staircase to the kitchen. I would hang stuff up really high because no <laughs> one would take it down. Because, you know, like stuff just gets moved around so much. But I'm like, if I exert slightly more effort than the average person then this will last forever. Like, <laughs> that right the there is the best advice of living in a co-op. That's yeah. yes. If you want a if you want a picture of say your friend's goddaughter crying and chewing on a candle, <laughs> hang it like 9 feet up in the air where no one will ever take it down. <laughs> were were you there Ryan when the the paper palm tree went up in the living room? Yeah, that was Lee, wasn't it? It was Lee and Huck made it. Lee and Huck, yeah. That was that was be I think because of our band was tropical ambrosia salad. And they were like, it was like around Christmas time. They put up, they made a palm tree instead. And how long did that thing last? It lasted until Kira and I dismantled it because it was falling apart. And like pieces of the palm tree were sliding down. And, and we, we thought, uh Oh, maybe it's time to take this down. And so we did. And someone came to a party. That's what it was. And they said, Oh, that's still up. We said, yeah, you know about the origin of this? And they said, yeah, we put this up. I'm surprised it's lasted this long. And that's when Kira and I were like, do we, do we leave it? Do we take it down? What do we do? And then, it, and then sometime later it was dismantled and people missed it. It was a, it was a, um, a symbol of the co-op meetings for a long time. I'm so sorry that we dismantled it now. If that was something that was just a little bit, not eight feet in the air enough to, to be to escape I mean, I'm the... it was fragile i'm surprised it lasted as long i also have some really great pictures of this time that they closed down the street oh and we were playing music and stuff yeah. in the in university avenue there were barricades on either end of it on our like three block stretch and we like have great pictures we we pulled out like furniture we had mm -hmm. chairs um, they set up the band and people were playing. Oh, they brought a couch. We brought like a yeah. couch down there. And then we were just right. We just all night, we just rode our bikes in circles up and down the street. And at one point, some like construction people drove through and we moved everything to the sidewalk. And then after they were gone, we put everything back out and just had a party. Just like there were like 12 of us and we just partied like that all night. Do you know anything about that student's co-op sign when that went up? I think that went up when we were there. It looks pretty nasco -y. It does look pretty nasco -y. You know, I wasn't really affiliated with anyone who's talking with NASCO representatives, but I do remember we would occasionally get travelers who had found out about the co-op through their connection with other co-ops, and they would crash there for a few days. 
And that was always interesting. So it was cool to know that we were like on somebody's map somewhere <laughs> as a, as a destination. <laughs> it is strange whose maps we are on that we completely forgot. And then someone shows up and says, remember all this? And we're like, nope. <laughs> Which is great. It's awesome. Well, I know we had in the kitchen, C stole from the, he lived in the, like the Eugene Debs co-op out in like Oregon. And he like took the sign that said Eugene Debs co-op. And like, it was in our kitchen for a while. That's right. <laughs> I think a visitor from there finally said, we want our sign back and we returned it at some point. It was, that was a big deal. Yeah. I don't know why we would have had that, but I think it was C. But yeah, I remember the deep fryer. People would enjoy a popular plant and then deep fry lots of things. I was just talking to folks who lived there in the early 80s, and they were impressed when they had the bright idea to get a deep fryer. And then somehow, it, for some reason, it went away. Ours went away, too. I think it just over. We abused it, I'm sure, knowing knowing the co-op. It probably just got really gross. And then we were like, nah, let's either put it away or throw it out. That is how most uh, items would leave leave us, like tragic one-time accidents or just months to years of neglect and eventually getting gross and then just never being seen again. There must have been some co-op or somewhere who would just like make the call to throw something away. Or we just deep fried everything. And then we, we got to the point where we were deep frying things that like weren't good to deep fry. Carrots and raisins and stuff. Yeah. And then it's just like, you know, we basically grossed ourselves out to the point where we're like, no, let's not do this anymore. Let's put this somewhere where we, where we can't get into it, where we're not tempted by it. <laughs> <laughs> but I did also want to mention the supper club when I lived there the second time was incredibly well participated in. The first time I was there, it was really, tr- it was actually really hard because someone on the supper club don't have anything against her, but she was vegan. And so that really limited what people could knew how to cook or were able to share with, with the group because you either had to do a whole meal and then do something separate for the people who were vegan, or you just made the whole thing vegan. So I remember, and I didn't know how to cook that time. I remember this horrible experience where Tim J and I tried to make pasta. We overcooked the noodles and we didn't know how to make a sauce. So I think we didn't even have a sauce, but, but I think I had the bright idea of like, Oh, it needs onion. And it was like, overcooked noodles and raw onion and i remember <laughs> i remember see this i saw this vision in my head of tim j taking a fork of it and <laughs> eating it and then it just like staring off into the distance of like his own like disgust and disappointment in this experience so that was the low of the low of the supper club and then when i lived there with laurel we got into cooking lots of stuff and we we cooked a lot of indian food mm-hmm. and And I remember my friends and my bandmates, Kira and Lee, got me this Indian cookbook that I had like borrowed from the library. And that ended up being something we were cooking out of all the time. I just remember there was this very rich excitement about feeding, you know, there's like 15 people or something involved at this point. So you were having food cooked for you at least like five days a week or something. And we were all super close because I didn't realize, Laurel, like you said, that it was special that we all lived there for a long stint and and few people moved in or out. Like I thought, I don't know, like, I guess I didn't, I wasn't aware of that being a special scenario, but we all got really close, I feel like in that time. And that's something that has transcended the co-op and become, you know, just these friendships that have lasted. Mm-hmm. Like yours and mine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You have like two or three people signed up per day and it was like Sunday through Thursday. That's what it was. Yeah. There were, there were like 12 or 15 people. It took me a long time to learn how to not cook that much food. Cause that's also how I learned to cook. Yeah. So like one day we made, we, it was like all pies, but we made like, you know, pot pie and stuff like that. <laughs> um, or we did a kid's meal one time, things kids would want. So we had like mac and cheese and ants on a log and stuff like that. We got really, really into it. And the kitchen is like the heart of that building. Yeah, it's true. I'm guessing this is true for a lot of the different eras, but we spent most of our communal time in the kitchen. In the summer, maybe more on the porch, but Mm -hmm. it was probably split 50-50 even then. 
Did you have retreats to other places? I think that was just after us. Did you guys do that? Yeah, I think Anya Svano became president and decided to say, hey, we've saved a lot. We deserve retreats. We're going to do them. And so we started going to Sandstone regularly. And I believe that lasted for six or seven years. Cool. It looks like studentscoop.org kind of was completed around 2004, but there wasn't yet Facebook. Yeah, we had Facebook. Facebook was like 06 or something. Really? Okay, because yeah. there's a the Facebook page says it started November 2010. So there must have been a different Facebook we, page. We had a different group called Students Co-op Enthusiasts, which I think still exists. Yes, just- it does. I just looked and it hasn't been posted on in a long time. Yeah. Not everyone had text because I remember, Ryan, when you and I first met, you were like texting me and my phone didn't get texts. <laughs> and you were like, why aren't you texting me back? <laughs> I don't um, remember that. I remember you've always had holding yeah. on one step back. I'm like five steps back now. But even like email, like Gmail and stuff was relatively new. And I remember trying to get everyone's email addresses so I could <laughs> email the whole house with please list which bike is yours. Please sign up for which parking spot is yours or whatever, like trying to organize people via email. And that was not everyone had it or whatever. Steve Bice was the one the first time I lived there who put together all those bike racks. I don't know if they're even still there, but those wooden bike racks were eventually replaced with ones that don't damage bicycles. (laughs) Well, fine. (laughs) But I used those and I was fine with them. I, I loved them and I loved the co-op-y look of them, the homemade look. But entertainment wise, I mean, we had a TV, we, had, we watched a lot of movies. We had a lot of house shows and stuff like that. Um, so I actually met somebody, I live here in Milwaukee and I met somebody who had been to house shows at the co-op. Really strange. <laughs> Did you live with Egan? Oh yeah. Like we're, I'm very good friends with Egan. Egan played great music around the campfire. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I saw Egan last weekend. He's in Madison. Yeah, a lot of a lot of jamming. I mean, Ryan, you were in a band. There were like two or three house bands associated with the co-op. I always remember being really nervous during house shows because the floor in the back corner of the front room was like so jiggly. <laughs> I never wanted people to dance back there. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> we did uh, have a structural engineer warn us that Dancing should not take place on the front porch whatsoever. The front porch? Oh my God. Yeah, I always thought this was also in the era of when those like fix up your house cable shows were on. And I just thought we should try to trick uh, one of those shows into doing the co op. Be like, we're going to redecorate. Can you fix the structural repairs first? But that yeah. idea was off the ground. Laurel, were you, were you there? Was that? The first or the second year I lived there when we were obsessed with the show Arrested Development. I think it was probably the first time for you. Okay. I remember that was like a show that drew everyone in and we like, you know, binged watch it before there was binge watching basically on that, that television that had been there for who knows how long in the corner of the living room. But uh, yeah, so I was in one of the bands that was called Tropical Ambrosia Salad. All co-opers in that band. Yes, yes. It was it was like one of the best things I've ever done in my life, I think, is to be part of that band with with a bunch of co-opers. And it was Tim J, me, Kira, Coonan, and Lee Delagard. And that was an incredibly rich experience. And I'm sure we annoyed the heck out of you know our housemates because we were always practicing in one of our rooms. I was in the room next door, I think, to Tim J, and I would hear you guys practicing. And that was something I I loved about the co-op was hearing bands practice through the wall. I think you've you've told me that before, so I appreciate you saying that. (laughs) Do you have any recordings or links that we could put in the show notes? I wish. We used to have, of all things, a MySpace page. There it is. Yeah. There's, there's our band there. I'm wearing this uh, ridiculous time jacket I found in like a thrift shop somewhere. It had a giant clock on the back of it. It looks like you're playing in the Thorpe building in Northeast. Yes, we did play there once. How could you recognize that from that picture? I don't know, but we did play there once. We played 
What was the place called over on University Avenue in St. Paul's? Johnny V's, is that the name of it? I think those pictures are from, um, there was like the Sisters Camelot warehouse over in Seward. Yeah, I, I mean, I remember going to that space, but we had a, a bunch of cool shows. I just found the MySpace and it says the top tracks for Tropical Ambrosia Salad are October Day. That's it. Chicka Chicka. Is it? So you still have, you still found it there. Yeah. Welcome to my Opium Den demo <laughs> and Bitter Tea demo. Yeah. yeah. Kira was our was our songwriter. Tim Tim and Kira were the real musicians. Lee and I were just trying to kind of follow along with them as best we could. Yeah, so so that was our that was our band. Then I left to to go explore Europe for a while and and when I came back, I didn't move back into the co-op. I moved in with Laurel and Huck. And and uh, unfortunately, that was, I guess, the band kind of had started to fall apart, as as they do. Tim and I are still really good friends. And he, he also played his own music. James Schaff was in also, uh, I think, a number of bands. Was, was Huck in a band? He was a solo musician. Yeah, okay. I remember when we lived together, he would play his own music. And then, of course, Egan was still like playing his own music yeah anya d was a talented musician too there's a bunch of really skilled people there how did you all find out about the co-op uh there was someone there named laura who uh i had a german class with and i had lived in minneapolis moved up there in 2005 i moved up there to be closer to my, you know, now very long ex-girlfriend to make a relationship, try to keep it going. And it didn't. And so I lived my first year in Minneapolis in this, in Southeast Como, in this like rooming house that was really kind of like just a hole in the wall. And then I met Laura and she said, oh, there's this house, you should move into it. Were you Uh, going to the University of Minnesota at the time? Yes. That's how we knew each other. So I applied and got in. Then of course, connected with a a bunch of people, but I felt like I connected maybe with like quarter of the people the first time I lived there. And then when I moved in the second time, it was like three quarters of the people I was close with or something. It was a, it was like a very different experience. Yeah. I went to the university of Minnesota Morris, which is like part of the U system, but it's about three hours West of the twin cities. One of my friends from college named Svee moved into the co-op and he was actually the recruitment manager and I remember like visiting him over the break one time when we went to hard times. And then he <laughs> sort of recruited me and Egan and two other friends of ours out of Morris. Well, actually, there were a couple Morris people, Christy. And, There's a bunch. Yeah, we kind of. You guys like invaded. I even remember one time some this new guy moved in. I, I don't even remember what, what his name was. And uh, Trisha was like do you live here or are you a person from Morris? And he was like, I live here. And she's like, no, you're not. You, you must be from Morris. And that's really <laughs> funny. And he just like thought, cause he kind of just like looked like us. And we're like, no, but we all live there as non-students like right after graduation. And I remember feeling, should I even apply to this? Because I'm not a student and it says you have to be a student. And so he's like, anyone can apply it. And then we vote on who lives here. So like you get voted in, then it's fine. You created the precedent that allowed me to, yeah. live there because apparently I mean, the second Kira was part of a cohort that abolished the rule that you have there, to be a student. When we lived there, actually, there was a time when one of the recruitment managers no longer wanted non-students to live there. And that got kind of awkward because at the time, the president, vice president, treasurer, and secretary were all non-students. And we're like, so do you want us to all move out? Like, it was just kind of a weird, I think it was just like a power thing. There are those weird power things. In the yeah. And Let's talk about that. <laughs> well, I think it was like, um, I mean, to me, it was very obvious that it was very beneficial to have a variety of people at different stages in life living there. Because, for example, we wouldn't all leave at winter break or whatever, mm-hmm. different hours, different um, level of commitment. When I moved in, though, there were also people who had lived there for years. There's also Jason and Brian, and they had each lived there, I think, at least 10 or close to 10 years and weren't super involved in everything. Mm-hmm. Even I think Steve Bice was a little bit older, but oh my God, if he hadn't lived there, it probably would have had 10 times the problems or 10 times the expenses because he could just he could fix anything. You know, he knew how to fix everything. And he would just be like, Hey, can you help me put drywall up? I remember that happened the first year I was there. I was just like me. 
And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, okay. So I helped him put up drywall in the room I lived in. Yeah. That was pretty empowering. Did you all have favorite rooms that you stayed in? First room was 13. Go ahead. I said, I only stayed in two rooms and I don't remember the order system. I want to say it was number 10. It was the first one. If you walked up the second floor stairs and took a right, it was that one. And then, so I lived with Micah when I got offered to move in. So he was like, are you okay living with a male roommate? And I said, depends on the guy. <laughs> um, and I guess that Micah said the same thing regarding having a female roommate. And it was fine. It was never a problem. The first time I needed to change in there and he was in there, I was like, hey, I'm changing. Don't look. And then he just didn't look and it was fine. (laughs) And when he moved out, this other guy moved in and I don't remember this guy's name, but I did not like him. He was one of those people who would like, why won't women date me? And it's like, maybe it's because you hate women. And then one night he like puked a bunch of times in the room. And then I was like, I'm out. I asked uh, Egan if I could live with him (laughs) and Egan said, I don't know. I masturbate a lot. (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, so is that a yes or a no? And he's like, I mean, if you want. (laughs) And then I lived with Egan in the, it was on the third floor in that middle room. Oh, you lived in the top room overlooking the street. Mm -hmm. I think that was the prize room. It is a prize room. Egan had lived there with Johnny. Do you remember Johnny? Johnny was deaf. Yeah. Oh. He had a Bowflex machine and he used to <laughs> use the Bowflex machine and make all sorts of noise. And he, like, he doesn't realize how much noise he's making using this Bowflex at 7 a.m. Like, <laughs> and like, I think a Bowflex machine makes a lot of noise. I don't know. <laughs> but actually, while I was living in that room with Egan, I remember he got swine flu. Remember swine flu? And he got pneumonia as well. Um, oh, crap, really? Egan's mom, like, I don't know how she had my number, but she called me and she was like, you have to take care of him because people die from swine flu and pneumonia combination. And I was like, okay. I but remember I, getting really sick at the co-op once too, yeah, actually. You were super sick. You had like a cold for like three months. I had a cold that I think caused me to crack a rib. I was coughing so hard because I remember one morning waking up and being like, I can't breathe. You know, like, and I remember calling the the nurse and I was just like, I, I think I, you know, like, I think I thought I had punctured a lung and they're like, no. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And then I remember after I got better, every time I'd laugh, it would hurt for like a month. So I think, <laughs> oh, yeah, terrible. Like, that was, I think the worst I got, but this was also, do you remember this Laurel? I, was it Svi that introduced the whole house to hot toddies? Yes. Do you remember the song? What's a hot toddy? Hot toddy. Hot toddy. Hot toddy. Uh, <laughs> you don't know what a hot toddy is? I'm sorry. <laughs> it's like tea with like a bunch of lemon juice and a bunch of honey and then like a big old glug of whiskey. Yeah. And it was it, like uh, the way you get it. He didn't winter. live in Arizona. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. None of us had insurance. Like it was before Obamacare. So they, I remember all, there would always be these news articles about young invincibles because it was like young people who are graduated from college who didn't have health insurance. Yeah. And it was just like, yeah, cause we can't afford it and there's nowhere to get it. So we just are going to ride around and like live in this weird co-op and just not have health insurance and crack a rib, you know, that's, that's, uh, how cool. or get swine flu. Uh. Well, interesting connection to the People's Center, which had by this point become a medical center. That's Without right. insurance, I was able to go over there. I think it was 20th and Riverside or something like that. Yeah. And just on the West Bank. And there. get care. Mm-hmm. I think I ended up going there once, like years later. Mm-hmm. I just have this memory of him. He was really sick, and I was kind of avoiding staying in the room because I didn't want to get sick. So I was spending a lot of time in somebody else's room somebody else was spending a lot of time in Egan's room and he had a really bad fever and he told me he was like sitting and looking out the window over like University Avenue and just being like look at all the people down there (laughs) just like really like having a fever and looking at all the little ant people walking by I think about that sometimes (laughs) oh yeah I've had moments like that so when co-opers got together and hung out outside the co-op where did they go we played 
both the times I lived there, we played so much freaking Frisbee in that little, what is it? The Bell Museum? Is that what it's called? Yeah. In the little alcove behind that, it was like a perfect amount of space. And we would go there in the summer. It was like a daily blowing of the conch. We'd head out there like after dinner and we would just run and run and run and run and laugh our butts off. Mm -hmm. And it felt like it was the majority of the house being there. It really felt like blissfully communal. Mm -hmm. I learned how to ride a bike at the co-op. Yeah. And we used to ride our bikes a lot. We would ride in the summer. We would ride to the beach, Mm -hmm. like Hidden Beach, or sometimes we'd go to Lake Nokomis. The co-op didn't have air conditioning. So I remember sometimes you had to, you was like, all right, it's too hot to sleep. So we have to bike to the water and jump mm-hmm. in. Hidden Beach was sometimes clothing optional. Am I right? I don't remember that as much at Hidden Beach, but Nokomis, I definitely got, you know. Yeah, uh, that as well. <laughs> I just remember once, like, we went to Nokomis. I don't know if this is when I lived there or afterwards, but it could have been either. And then the cops saw our heads and they were like, get out of the water. And they had the big spotlight on us. And then I walked out and I was naked. And then the spotlight just went, just turned away immediately. (laughs) Didn't get a ticket, luckily. Yeah, I never got caught. So, no, I wasn't there. (laughs) How comfortable were co-opers with uh, bodies? Because I remember there was quite a bit of nudity on the retreats. Oh. So this was before you were there, Laurel. I remember... (laughs) James Schaff. <laughs> and there was this other woman who was there named Grace. She was like a student at one of these super tiny private colleges where you can kind of like design your whole, your own major and all that. And she was super inspired by the co-op. And, and then her senior project when she went back was to try to make a co-op. She was so inspired, but she was also really into art. And I remember, I think it was her and James at one point, Closed off a room and were doing body painting where, where they would like cover themselves with paint and they had this huge thing of paper. And I think they were getting really silly. And I remember James then showing me later and being like, this is where my ball sat on this page, you know, because that's he was proud of that. And I was, too. So, <laughs> you know how you try to explain the co-op to people who have never been there and they just don't get it. No, they and- don't. I remember at some point somebody being like, wait, there were 28 people in three showers. Didn't you have to like wait to shower all the time? And I was like, you know what? No, we never really had to wait. So I think there was mostly comfort with smells and like absolutely filthy feet, just like the nastiest, grossest feet, mine among them. So I think that's about it. That's, and a lot of like, you know, sleeping in the same bed or sleeping on the couch together or, or whatever. It just like very platonically sleeping on the porch together or whatever. But I don't live there anymore. But why do I want to suddenly create like a foot bath for the co-op? It's like once you <laughs> live there, you keep coming up with ideas. You you just never really leave in your mind in a way. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I was talking with my wife, Jocelyn, about that very thing that you just mentioned, Laurel didn't you have to wait to use the bathroom? And I was just like, no, it never happened. And it's not like we didn't ever bathe. That's not the case either. Maybe if everyone had the same work and class schedule, that would have happened. But yeah, but it was, it was relaxed. And I'm sure some people bathe every day and some people bathe once a week. Sometimes after a Frisbee, we would literally hose each other down in the front yard. Mm. That happened once or twice. I think there was a time and a place because by the time I lived there, the bathrooms were in high demand and they were locked. Mm. Interesting. Uh, When I was there, um, the first time, I think, I think it was the first time Steve Weiss uh, installed a urinal into one of those bathrooms. (laughs) That's who it was. I've been trying to figure that out. That thing was so janky. Yeah, it was not right. It was not right. We got rid of it. Urinal that's literally facing the toilet. Like Egan would be like, come on, we can use the bathroom at the same time. I'm like, no, you would be facing me and I would be facing you. And nobody wants that. (laughs) Why? You know, he had a mind that was very like utilitarian, not really um, design focused. So, Mm -hmm. so he was just like, this will save us water. Why not? We tried to install like a gray water system. I remember, I think on the second floor bathroom where instead of draining 
that we would make the sinks go into like buckets. I don't remember if that ever ended up happening or not. I can only imagine how gross it would have been. Oh yeah. <laughs> this is a weird question, Max. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Has anybody talked about when I lived there, we all had this understanding that somebody had died in the house. Yeah, oh, that's that's yeah. confirmed. Yeah, that's confirmed. Okay, it happened in the eighties. They were a veteran manic depressive. They because, were going to be evicted possibly, and mm-hmm. they killed themselves in the laundry room. I knew that part because there was a time when I was in the kitchen with the back door open, and somebody passed by but then didn't come into the kitchen. And I was like, I wonder who that was. And then I went and I opened up the room. Like I looked back and no one was back. You know, it's like you see somebody walk by and they're either going to go upstairs or they're going to come into the kitchen or not upstairs, like go into the laundry room. And they never came into the kitchen. And I like went and I like opened the door to the laundry room and no one was in there. And then I was like, oh, and then I started asking around and that's what the story that I heard. So I just wanted to know if that had, but that's like, it felt like such a rumor mill. No, yeah, I understand that. That does happen in the co-op, the rumor mills. However, that that is confirmed. His name was Kurt, I believe. And yeah, so you you might have experienced the ghost of Kurt. Yeah. Once I had experienced that, other people told me they had experienced the same thing of hmm. like seeing somebody going into the laundry room or something like that. I've always wondered about it. I remember once doing a little ceremony there to, uh, you know, just a little amateur thing, go to the light kind of thing it's an old house Mm. do you remember the house ever being called amigo club no did it go by any other names besides students co-op no i remember on halloween when there'd be like ragers up and down the block people not associated with the house would come in and try to come to the party and they'd ask what frat it was and we used to tell them it was called um like sega sega pie sega sega (laughs) Or Pi Sega Sega. I can't remember which one. Uh, so sometimes we called it that as a joke, but nothing nothing formal. I think that's going to have to go into a little hidden spot on the website. <laughs> I remember this, like, you know, inebriated party frat person being like, I met Sega Sega Pi, like, to his friend on the phone and just being very... Oh, t- no, you'll never be found. I know, I know. Oh, I don't think I was there when this happened, but I think it was shortly after or something that someone was in a super distressed state and smashed the front windows and like got all bloody and was sent to the hospital. Or me. It was before you? Yeah. Because okay, I- Okay, it must've been between when I lived there the first time and the second then. There was a ongoing lawsuit or something. I remember discussing in a house meeting because the people who didn't live there when it happened wanted to drop any sort of pursuit of that because- the restorative justice reasons and the people who lived there when it happened were like, you weren't there. It was so traumatic to have that happen. Like we want to pursue. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember feeling terrible that would be hanging over somebody, but I don't ever really know what happened with it. What was the culture like there in terms of interest in activism and creating a more equitable world It was Fee who kind of lit the fire about this. But when the custodial staff of the University of Minnesota went on strike because, you know, for better benefits, there was mostly indifference by the student body. And Fee, I remember at a a house meeting, was just like, we got to do something about this. And I remember even pushing back at him and being like, well, what do you mean? And then He's like, we got to give a shit. We have to like show that we can do something. And and we did in our small way. You know, we started organizing, I think, food to be distributed to the, the workers who were striking, put, you know, signs up around on, on the front facade. I, I don't know if it went beyond that besides like conversations or inviting people to have conversations about that situation, standing with the workers. And, but I remember that being ultimately a positive experience, not as awakening, perhaps as, you know, the more recent experiences that have just changed the world in Minneapolis and outward from there. But that was to a small extent, at least a demonstration of how people when they're in a, at least for me, a really, really loving environment can, can be inspired to then look out for their neighbors, for the members of the community that are kind of being overlooked. That's well said. Um, 
I think individuals were engaged in their pursuit of things. I remember talking about stuff, but there wasn't concerted effort to leverage the co-op space other than kind of getting involved with NASCO and stuff like that. A lot of individual efforts and a lot of folks were engaged with activism as students. Was the house closely associated with NASCO? I'm trying to get a read on that history too. That's a good question. I think we were, oh yeah, we did. There was a NASCO person who had come by, Layla Ananda. I remember she changed her name and everyone was very confused by that. (laughs) I remember that name too. Yeah. And she would come by and just kind of like chill and talk about NASCO with us. But I think it was the next generation that got into that, maybe with Anya and, and those folks. I mean, it is interesting to kind of look back now at the co-op and think about, I think with Black Lives Matter and to be honest, like me too, I think a lot of that stuff was flying under the radar when I was when I was there. I think one thing that I really value about the co-op is that if you're really part of the co-op, if you're really like there to co-create this house or this living situation or the world you want to see, no one's disposable within that. And if one person's struggling, then the community is, is sick, you know? I don't want to sound like I'm having some sort of screed against cancel culture, but I think it seems like some people are a little less willing to engage with people who have caused harm and and to truly restore that. And it's easier to just be like, based on your identity, I don't want to associate with you. And I think that's something that concerns me. You know, I'm an educator and I think that's creating a a concerning future for my students. (laughs) And then also just for the co-op, like I don't think it can exist as a homogenous group. I don't think it ever has. And I'd be leery of anyone who wanted to turn it into something like that. Although I think it has been homogenous in a lot of ways because the state of Minnesota is homogenous in a lot of ways. But I think it's important to just keep having this random mixture of beautiful people for as long as possible. Yeah, I hear you saying that there's a difference between accidental and and intentional homogeneity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's. I feel like when I lived there, I don't know if it's still the same, but you got voted in. I mean, there's like, obviously, clearly some negative things that could come from that. Like (laughs) all those people from Morris. Yeah. Like, you know, that it could be a a terrible place for prejudice to, you know, exclude uh, members of the community. But it also is a place to, you know, protect as well as because this this is why I feel like I've one of my challenges with this podcast even is I want to name all the names. Yeah, I want to tell you too. every single person I lived there with, even if I didn't have the best relationship, or even if I was a jerk at some point to them. Or Absolutely. They were to me. I want because, to be totally transparent and it's just not possible. <laughs> yeah. But, but what I'm saying is that place was a love feast of relationships. It was like, that's where it happened. You know, that's where I have friendships there that are my, the strongest friendships of my life. I wanted to wait at some point to just before I before I just like started waxing on and on about this. But I did want to share this at one point that that what the co-op taught me was that everybody deserves to live in a place where they feel like they're super lucky to live there and where they feel like they're in a community of the best people they could possibly imagine. And everybody deserves to have a real genuine experience of community like that. And a chance to learn to live in a way you haven't before with other people who are welcoming you into that and to welcome others into it too, to be there as like the the space holders for for others coming into it and not yet part of that. And I'm glad because like, it's, uh, I'm losing my train of thought. It's, (laughs) it's, it's a place yeah, that served that for me, at least. I certainly want other people to experience that because once you live there, I've talked with Tim about this, and I think you too, Laurel, you immediately question like, why isn't this more common? Why can't there be more of these? Why does this feel so unique and, and strange? And is and really what timeless. <laughs> yeah, uh, like uh, there's, there's no good answer as to say like why everybody shouldn't get the chance to live in a community of like supportive people that's, you know, relatively inexpensive because of the removal of one aspect of capitalism that does hurt people, you know, like the the idea that there's a landlord that profit motive. Thank, thank you. That's the part that's removed. And that's the simplest thing to remove in one sense that then allows the people living there to have more freedom 
to not feel like at least for the time they live there that they have to work really hard just to like pay rent you know that they can spend more of their time and energy discovering what their gifts are and sharing them and since i live there in small ways in different ways my life has been influenced to search for those qualities in not just the place i live now but you know the jobs i have the the the, the friends i have that's that's one of the deep impacts on me and i i think that's that's a legacy that no one person or even one group of people can claim it's just like it's just a good thing and it needs to be lifted up wow beautiful words yeah i think max you could just cut everything we've said and just play that as this episode <laughs> i think that's the meat of it that's the heart of it as ryan is so good at getting to the heart of things but i would agree i would agree with with all of that and especially this morning, my partner asked me, like, why Why do you think people live in co-ops or why do you think it's a good idea? And I, that was essentially my answer, too, of just the, the beauty of those relationships. We lived in the co-op over 10 years ago. Yeah, um, wow. 15 years ago. I work at a school that's like a collectively run school, and I bought a house with my best friend from childhood. And so I'm like, I would not have done those things. I wouldn't be ready to do those things without having lived at the co-op. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about something sad. Why did you each leave the co-op when you did? For me, it was kind of two reasons. One is I think there was a cohort change as I was toward the end of my time. You know, we, we were both referred to the sort of unbroken period. Some of those people left and more people came in and it just wasn't the same. So I think that was part for me of the like slow crumble of me wanting to be there. And then... Being a house manager got to be kind of a drag, <laughs> especially with some of the newer people coming in. When I was growing up in my household, we had this rule that when uh, you know you came home from school or came home from work, as soon as you walked in the door, somebody wouldn't be like, "So and so called and called them back," and so and so did this. Like yes. you could have time to like take off your shoes and like put down your jacket and get a drink of water, and then you could get your phone messages or whatever. And that stopped happening for me there. Like I would come in and people would be like, you're the house manager, solve this problem for me. And I'd be like, like my bike lights are blinking. Like, can you just give me a second? And so I just felt a little bit like I felt harried (laughs) by my job duties, which looking back, like what, what does that even mean? And then, yeah, I I had an opportunity to, to move out. So, you know, those sorts of factors sort of led together. Uh, yeah, I feel like in, in my small way, I like, I was trying to pull you out of there because I had decided, you know, after traveling in Europe and kind of having an identity change around my sexual orientation at that time and, and just feel, feeling like I was exploring a new part of my life, I felt like I needed a new space. I felt like I had to move out in a certain sense. Like if I stayed there, I would have been just clinging to something, wanting is something to say the same instead of like going out and finding my path or whatever. And I definitely have regrets about certain decisions I made around that time as everyone I'm sure does, but that's definitely one where I'm like, huh, what would have happened if I just had tried just moving back there? And I think I had decided before I traveled to Europe in, um, what was it? 2009 that I, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I didn't think you were going to come back. So. Well, that that was my intention. And I felt, to a certain extent, like I had failed, I guess I felt like I needed a new place just to, to, so I didn't feel like I had failed, (laughs) which it's, you know, that's whatever, that's my own emotional stuff. But then I ended up after I lived with Laurel and Huck, then I lived with two other co-opers, Cole and Pete. And then after that, I lived with Tim. So like, you know, I took pieces of the co-op with me. First, I forced Laurel in my small way out of there. And then I, you know, found other people to kind of glom on to. There's a pattern I'm noticing of people moving out, following their hearts and following their dreams as if the co-op trains one to do so. It, yeah, it sets high dreams, high stakes. I couldn't go back. Yeah. I had to go forward. Yeah. So interesting that you have that pattern, Ryan, because when I moved out of America, I had also given up on America thought there was nothing there for me. And when I was forced to come back, discovered the co-op and felt as though I had been missing something 
beautiful the whole time. The first time I moved out of the co-op was just much more like practical, like, oh, I graduated college. I had this opportunity to live in an apartment on my own. Okay, I'll try this out. By the end of that year that I lived on my own, I was like crushed. I was like so feeling separate from community. And I remember one day going back to the co-op and I felt I felt like I was the prodigal son or something. Like I just wanted to hang out with the people there. Somehow it all worked out. Like I, you know, I got invited to live to move back in and it felt like I was restored in a essential way. The second year there was really like the golden age of of my like I don't know coming of age or whatever finding myself and all that so and and then yeah and then it felt like okay what's next after this now I've lived in the co-op pair of experience has been given this gift how can I where is it taking me next it's so artificial and and forced to be like what's the funniest stories from the co-op it's like a really small memory but to me it sort of summed up the energy of the house this guy he went out to play like bike polo or something like that. And he came back later in the night and he had been hit by a car on his bike. And I believe it was actually a police car was the story. And they just like had dropped him off back at the co-op. We were all kind of like, okay. And then he went off to his room and then we were all kind of like, I'm not sure. Like, should we go check on him? Like, is he okay? And then his roommate went in and he had some injury, like a, broken broken something or a sprained something or whatever and then we're like do you have insurance and he's like yeah but then he had self-medicated to not have pain and he's like i can't go to the hospital they'll they'll catch me and i'll be in trouble and so everyone like rallied together to like go take him to the hospital they're like you have health insurance let's go take you to the hospital five people went and took him i didn't go and then five minutes later they all came back and were like we're all too drunk to drive. Who can drive him to the hospital? <laughs> Everything was a little bit madcap and like things were totally ridiculous. That was sort of just like the mood. I love it. I love that I asked you, what's the funniest story? And you're like, well, one time someone was hit by a car. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's awesome. Beautiful. Whenever I'm around co-opers, we just pull stories out of each other just naturally. The, the hijinks were always kind of over the top there, but... But then we would just wake up and start over again every day. Any advice to future egalitarians and coopers? I was thinking about the motto, like that we'd always say, like, we own it. That doesn't seem like advice, but I think that is my advice of like, you own it. As I said, I, I work in a collective now and it's really freaking hard to navigate and to manage the relationships and the expectations. But one thing I've noticed we, we hired almost entirely new staff last year, and it's taken some people a long time to step up and realize that they actually own it. Whether, you know, you're waiting for invitation or whether you're waiting for permission, you learn over the course of your life, especially, you know, in school and all that stuff, that you're kind of a powerless cog. And um, then when all of a sudden you're not, it's really scary and it's really hard and it's, and it's an extremely gray space. You know, we use all these words to describe it, like imposter syndrome or whatever, but like actually being in control and being able to create and uncreate and recreate all those systems without permission, you have to find a way to to do it that feels good, but you can do it. And no one's going to say, okay, Ryan, now do this. You just have to like, just do it. Actually believing that you own something and that you're in control and you have collective autonomy no one can make you feel that way. You just have to find a way that, that you feel it. Thank you so very much, you two, for joining me. Thanks for taking the time to gather all this uh, random information and memories and tears and laughter. Not everybody wants to reminisce, perhaps, but... <laughs> nope. <laughs> you actually are a rare sort. I think a lot of people are a little bit... There's a separation in their minds y'all and i are of a type that it changed our lives in a way that we do we don't want that separation like that that cooperativeness is like a part of us now Mm -hmm. part of our identity in some way i think yeah you know when you said that 
I feel like if I had tried moving back into the co-op and staying there and I stayed another year or two, or maybe even more than that, I definitely wouldn't have this, this feeling about it (laughs) that I do now, you know, it would be like, oh yeah, I lived there for a while. And then I moved on. Well, yeah, I'm glad I got to talk to both of you. I was hesitant to do this. And then I was like, oh yeah, I'll just sit and shoot the breeze with Ryan. Do that. for Sure. Time. So it was a good, good call. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say like my friendship with Ryan has been one of the best things that's come out of the co-op. So. Yes. And has survived distance for many years now, which is crazy because that's hard to do, but she was in my wedding along with Tim this, uh, just a few months ago. So. (sighs) Well, I can do this all day. I have to get ready for work. All right. I hope you enjoyed hearing that as much as I enjoyed recording it. Tune in next time for more co-op memories. If you'd like to check out photos and show notes from this episode or other episodes, visit podcast.studentscoop.org and click on Album. I'm happy to report that the pre-1940s period has been getting some more documentation, and I hope you'll check it out and enjoy that as well. Thanks to Laurel for preserving this sample of tropical ambrosia salad, which will play our way out. Have a happy winter solstice, everyone.